Tell us a little bit, I know that you're an insulin resistance expert in terms of the research and what's been happening and, and how important that is. But many, many people have high insulin, they don't even know, they do the glucose test, they do the HB alpha 1c, it all looks good, the doctor gives them a clean bill of health, except their insulin is really, really high, they're really insulin resistant, and they're not looking at a continuous glucose reading, knowing, hang on, actually the food that I eat here, this, this food is possibly not the best for me because it's giving me glucose spikes. Yeah. So uh, again, if we, if we tie that, you know, start by tying this into the brain, uh, some people have, have called Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes. So it's basically insulin resistance uh, within the brain. Uh, and then you have reduced ability of the brain to get the energy that it needs in order to function, which can then be associated, you know, then it has to decline in its function because it just can't support the, the function that it needs. And, if you look at even early stage changes in glucose regulation, as you might call it, so something like pre-diabetes, so you just have an elevated fasting blood sugar, uh, but you wouldn't be called diabetic, you wouldn't necessarily get any interventions, then that's even associated with a dramatic increase in the risk of, of um, cognitive decline or out dementia or, or Alzheimer's disease, depending on how you diagnose it. And this starts very early uh, in life, and we know that it's very common. So. Uh, probably at least 80 to 90 percent of the adult population in westernized societies have some degree of insulin resistance or, or metabolic disease um, and this is essentially a function of our environment and our diet um, so you know including some of the pillars that we've already talked about but you know diet diet in particular and there's um, some very nice data that says that your cognitive function is directly tied to your glucose variability so so this can if you Looking at papers, you might find something called the MAGE, which is the mean amplitude of glycemic excursions. And in some studies where they've looked at this, the, the bigger your MAGE, so basically the more variable your blood sugar is, the worse your cognitive function is. And importantly, it's reversible. So if you, if you decrease your MAGE, and in, in, in uh, trials they've done this with medications, but I believe you can probably do it with diet as well. So if you decrease your glucose variability, you can then improve your cognitive function even as an older adult. So again, the brain isn't, you know, fixed um, in the way that we're, we're told that it is. Um, and so you then might want to think, well, what, it, what are the things that cause these big swings in, in my blood sugar? And, and the problem is that the more we learn about blood sugar, the more we realize that it's impossible to predict from one person to the next. So we used to talk about things like glycemic index and glycemic load. And to be honest, I think those should just be retired. They're essentially nonsense because when you look at how one individual responds to the same food, it is so variable. And it, it's based on genetics, gut microbiota, um, the, the context of the meal. Like, did you just work out? Have you just woken up? Is this breakfast? Is this dinner? Uh, it depends on what else is in, in the meal. It depends on your overall metabolic health. So your HbA1c is a better predictor of your glycemic excursions than the carbohydrate content of the food. Um, and so we, we're now getting to a point where I couldn't tell you whether a certain food is good or bad for your blood sugar, right? You could have a piece of cake. And for you, actually, your blood sugar doesn't change very much, but mine changes a lot. Um, and it's, so it's kind of it's surprising and fascinating, but then introduces a, a problem uh, because we can't just say this food is good or bad for your blood sugar. Um, and so continuous glucose monitoring, I think, uh, can be uh, the, the thing that allows us to, to, to bridge this gap. And you probably only need maybe two to four weeks of data because we just eat the same foods again and again, right? You don't need to see um, so let's say you have cornflakes for breakfast, right? You don't need to see this big blood sugar spike after your cornflakes 12 times. You probably need to see it twice.